everyone who is uh, listening in or viewing the uh, tape of this uh, particular lecture. Uh, a little bit of explanation. This lecture is a little unusual uh, compared to the others. Um, why, what I um, uh, did in formulating the series was to assume that uh, this might be a class that a professor or an adjunct uh, would to teach. And exercise 12, which um, maybe some of you have looked at, maybe most of you have not, uh, that is a um, bidding round for blocks. So on the map here, we have block 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 21 through 25, and 31 to 35. And so exercise 12 uh, has uh, teams of students uh, work some data uh, in a map form, and I'll show you a little bit of that, and then uh, uh, submit bids. And so this particular lecture time, uh, about half of the lecture time would be to conduct the, uh, the lease sale, to open the envelopes and see who is the winner of each of the blocks. So uh, in the exercise 12, uh, there is a map that shows uh, drainage divides and where uh, some of the main structural highs are located. Uh, there's a map for the source facies, the Golden Beach. And if you uh, listen to the previous uh, lecture, I went over some of the um, regional geology of the Gippsland Basin, uh, which is uh, where this data comes from. And up in the Northwest, uh, the source is more uh, likely to generate gas. Uh, in the Southeast, it's more likely to generate oil. And in the center, uh, it, where it says mixed, uh, it would be a combination of uh, generating oil and gas. Uh, the present day source maturity, uh, kind of the peach color up here is immature. We haven't started generating anything from the uh, primary source rocks. Uh, the second uh, green area here is where we're primarily in the oil window, generating mostly oil with a minor amount of gas. Uh, it's uh, hotter and deeper here in this uh, region with the kind of blue stippling. Uh, that's the gas only window, so all the oil has already been generated. And in the far southeast, the gray area is where the source would be overmature. All the hydrocarbons would have been generated present day. Uh, the Latrobe is the main reservoir. And uh, in the Northwest, it's uh, uh, a fluvial depositional environment, fluvial sands. Uh, we go into a transitional fluvial to near shore, to predominantly near shore, and then offshore. And then the lake entrance is the seal sitting on top of the reservoir, and it has a fair sealing quality or capability to good, uh, and then the green is excellent. And so teams would work on this. Uh, perhaps they might look at this particular area with a structural culmination at Nanocline here. Uh, and if it turned out that this was uh, uh, where the source generated oil, it was in the oil window. It had near shore sands, which is the best reservoir quality. It had an excellent top seal. It does have a large drainage area. Then this particular uh, anticline high uh, would be a very um, good candidate to uh, place a lot of money on. So uh, this is hypothetical. If you looked at all the maps, uh, this area in uh, block 13 doesn't have these characteristics. This is just for illustration. Uh, just to review very quickly, what we're looking at in, in the uh, area of the lease sale, we have fluvial to uh, nearshore sands. We have a major unconformity called the top latrobe, uh, the uh, rocks from uh, late Cretaceous to uh, middle Ligocene are the latrobe group. And then on top of that is the sealing lake entrance formation. And so what we're prospecting for is a sub unconformity trap with uh, rotated fault blocks forming the, um, the structures. And so part of the mapping that's uh, done in unit 13 
is to map this main unconformity. So uh, what we would do is we would uh, have uh, the lease sale and different teams would uh, present their bids. So Alpha bid 3 million on block 11, uh, Delta bid 7 million. So it goes to the higher highest bidder. And so in this case, block 11 would go to the team Delta. I don't want to show all of the results. Uh, uh, I don't want to give away the uh, answer if someone is doing this as, a, uh, as an exercise in a uh, classroom setting. What would happen after the lease sale? A uh, geophysical company that uh, contracts to do seismic acquisition and processing, uh, they might uh, obtain a moderately spaced 2D survey. We'll look at that in a couple minutes. Uh, the final processing wasn't available at the time of the lease sale, but now we can buy that uh, seismic data and use that now that uh, uh, we might have uh, one or two or three of the 15 blocks. Uh, unfortunately, our company is uh, trying to pinch some pennies, and so of the available data, uh, our company only bought every third east-west line and every fourth north-south line. So we, there's more data available, uh, but it's not available to us because of some uh, penny pinching. Uh, and actually, that's to make the, uh, the mapping exercise go a little faster as opposed to having uh, 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 10 times the number of lines. So the next task is to map the top of Latrobe unconformity using the 2D seismic survey. So uh, this is the regional setting. Uh, here's block 31, 32, 33. Uh, this is the feature that uh, our team uh, noted and uh, we uh, bid on these blocks and the, we won these blocks uh, based on that uh, feature. And now in blue is the uh, 2D seismic survey that covers that uh, particular prospect or lead. Um, the, it's actually the uh, Barracuda field. So for simplicity, I'll just call this the Barracuda lead at this particular uh, point in our scenario. So this is the base map that uh, you would have uh, if you uh, wanted to do exercise 13. Um, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, east-west lines and one, two, three, four, five north-south lines. The lines that have the red lettering and the red lines, the interpretation's already provided, and that's a way to speed up the uh, interpretation itself. And uh, if you were to do this on your own, given that uh, five of the lines are already interpreted, you could probably map this uh, top Latrobe unconformity in 40 minutes plus or minus. So here's an example line. This is line 10. Let me go up. So line 10 is uh, the westernmost north-south line. So uh, here south is uh, on the left and north is on the right. There's a normal fault here. There's another fault here that has a little bit of a reverse uh, movement on it late. And the top of the Latrobe unconformity is where this red line is located. It is characterized by having a bit more uh, continuous and higher amplitude reflectors beneath it, uh, moderate to low amplitude, less continuous reflectors above it. So if you had this line and it intersects the um, uh, east-west line number 66 right here, uh, so this is the east-west uh, line, what we can do is we can take the line that we have interpretation on, we can fold the intersecting line, line it up at the intersection point, and if this is my red horizon top latrobe, then I can say this is the top latrobe. So here we're looking uh, at a north-south line intersected with an east-west line. And so that is uh, essentially what you would do in the the uh, uh, mapping of the, uh, of the prospect. And here's the uh, main part of the anticline. That's the feature, the Barracuda lead, uh, that uh, our company bid for these uh, two blocks uh, based on. 
So uh, it's a pretty uh, short lecture, um, mainly because uh, it takes about 20, 25 minutes to do the lease sale and decide who uh, wins uh, which blocks. And uh, then uh, I show them where the known fields are. And uh, one of the teams is uh, extremely happy because they got the best uh, block or two, and the other teams are uh, happy because they've uh, learned some things uh, by doing the, uh, the uh, competition. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Frischetto and see if there are some questions. Uh, none so far. I wasn't expecting too many because it is pretty uh, short. Um, I'll have the schedule up here just to mention that next Tuesday we'll talk about prospect risking. So uh, we talked about new ventures, uh, a bit about prospect mapping, and then the next step would be to risk a prospect. And then uh, Thursday, a week from today, we'll talk about well seismic ties. How do we take information from a drilled well uh, things such as the uh, top of uh, different formations and tie that back to uh, uh, the seismic, uh, which particular peak or trough on the wiggle trace data corresponds to the top of the trove unconformity or the top of the Wilcox or the top of the uh, uh, middle Miocene. So just as a reminder to everybody, if you have a question, you can type it into the question box now. Uh, I did uh, text out through the chat box uh, the note on signing up for the webinar listserv, just so that you're, uh, those are constantly uh, in your inbox if they're happening. Um, and there is a question. Okay, so a uh, question from Noman Zeb, and uh, Noman asks, if we acquire data after winning the block, then how do we know that there could be that there could we study a structure which can trap hydrocarbons? Usually when the bidding is done, uh, we don't have uh, very dense data uh, or very well processed data. And so we, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's highly interpretive. Uh, we are hoping that the data density and quality is enough that we can find some of the major features that might uh, that might hold hydrocarbon. Once we have the block, then we would uh, do more detailed analysis uh, that may include uh, new seismic acquisition uh, and processing. It may mean reprocessing the existing data that we have and then trying to uh, mature that particular feature that we see uh, to, this, to the point that we can tell management, yes, we should spend, uh, say, $3 million to drill an exploration well, or no, we, we think uh, now that we have more information that that's not going to be an economic discovery. So. Um, it is uh, risky, and uh, depending on the terms of the uh, bid, uh, sometimes a company will uh, make a monetary bid of uh, so many million dollars, plus commit to drill one or two or maybe even three wells. And so the, the uh, landowner, let's say uh, offshore, we're talking about a government, uh, they will review not just the monetary bid, but the uh, work program, uh, how much uh, will you spend on geophysical data? How much will you uh, spend on drilling wells? How many wells do you promise to drill? Even if it uh, looks like the area uh, on closer inspection is not so good. So I hope I answered that question. And if not, the uh, person can uh, use the chat box and, and give me a follow up. Yeah, so he just uh, wrote a follow-up. Uh, so he asks, uh, so without having data, we can, but without knowing that there could be an economical amount of hydrocarbon. Well, we'll always have some data, but it's uh, usually not as, um, as uh, dense as we would like, and it's usually not as high uh, quality in terms of seismic processing as we would like. So a lot of times with new ventures uh, and bidding on blocks, we only have 
six months uh, to um, to work things up unless we've uh, done homework ahead of time. And so um, uh, a lot of it is uh, science, but a lot of it also is guesswork. All right, we have another question from uh, Dominic Nade, And Dominic asks, how useful or what information can we get from the top of the unconformity map we just did from the seismic lines? Uh, if we have the top of the unconformity, such as uh, shown here, uh, so we're looking at a portion of line 66, we can see that we have a, a big anticline or a structure. And then the question is, could this have a, a combination of a reservoir uh, uh, below a, a, a reasonably a good quality seal? Uh, that we also have to um, uh, consider whether or not we have a source rock and whether that source rock has uh, started to generate and migrate hydrocarbons. And then does this particular structure get fed by hydrocarbons that uh, are being generated in our source kitchen, uh, which uh, usually is uh, off structure. Um, and so those uh, five play elements that I've talked about uh, a number of times, source, reservoir, trap, seal, migration, all come into, uh, into account. So knowing the shape of the top of the reservoir tells me where some of the culminations are, where I might have structural traps. Uh, it tells me that uh, as hydrocarbons move by buoyancy, if we get hydrocarbons in this vicinity, it will percolate up to the top of the structure. Uh, the other thing that we can look for is some geophysical evidence that we might have uh, um, a change in fluid. And uh, I've worked this data. I happen to know that this is a fluid contact right here. Uh, there's kind of a white that cuts across the uh, inclined or dipping reflectors. And so it turns out that uh, this structure does have hydrocarbon, and this is a transition from gas above to uh, brine in the reservoir below. And so that's, that's pretty subtle, especially since we don't have a zoomed up uh, image of that. But that's the type of things that we can look at, uh, even on uh, uh, speculative data, uh, to try to um, determine where might the best uh, uh, drilling opportunities be and how much money should we uh, place on a bid for uh, one or more of the blocks that are up for bid. The other thing that's challenging is that uh, we're not the only people looking at the blocks. Uh, there might be 20 or 30 or 50 other oil companies uh, that have essentially the same data and uh, are trying to figure out where they should uh, invest some money uh, to obtain some, uh, some acreage so that they can do exploration and hopefully uh, eventually uh, develop and produce oil and gas. Thanks, Fred. Uh, there's a follow-up uh, to this one from John Ajembi, and John asks, from your experience, is it common for unconformities to be associated with hydrocarbon plays? Well, unconformities uh, form one type of uh, uh, trap, um, and um, uh, just because we have an unconformity does not mean necessarily we're going to have uh, a trap holding an economic amount of oil and gas. Uh, my own experience is that a lot of times we'll have a potential reservoir, and the question is, is it sealed with a uh, lithology that is able to hold uh, in place a thick enough column of oil or gas so that it would be economic. And in this particular uh, basin, uh, the overlying material above the red dotted line, the unconformity, is a deep water shale, and it does have a very good sealing uh, capacity. The, um, the, uh, in the discovery well, the gas column here was uh, 100 meters, and then there was an 11 meter thick oil column. 
So we have 110 meters of hydrocarbon that's being held in place by the lake entrance shale. So, uh, questions? Yeah. Um, so I have another question from David Little, and uh, David asks, would bidding at a place like this be in a place with no wells? Would there be any well data to help with the interpretation of the seismic data, or is that extrapolated from some distance away? Uh, it depends on uh, how much exploration has gone on within the basin or the sub-basin where the lease sale is. Uh, for the first uh, 15 years or so of my um, career with uh, Exxon at that time, uh, hadn't uh, merged with mobile, um, most of what I worked on were basins where we had uh, no well control. And so seismic data analysis was uh, the thing that we had to rely upon and then tried to figure out uh, did we have source and reservoir trap seal migration? Uh, was the timing uh, appropriate? Um, and thereby try to figure out uh, which uh, blocks in a particular basin uh, we thought were worth going after. So it can be done without well control. Uh, the more well control you have in the vicinity, uh, the more you can uh, calibrate your interpretation and uh, hopefully have a better understanding of what's going on in the subsurface where the blocks for uh, lease are available. Uh, I have another question from Dominic Nade, and he asks, do all companies also submit their results to the government of that country? Or do companies get to know what results other companies have derived from the same data? The, um, it, it varies a little bit from country to country. Uh, in most uh, cases, uh, any data that you collect, uh, the government has a right to get that data from you. Um, Oftentimes, the interpretation that you make based on that data, you can hold pro uh, as proprietary and uh, not give it uh, to the, uh, the host uh, uh, country. Um, typically, companies will not swap interpretations with other companies unless they decide to form a, um, a joint venture. And so a particular block here um, let's say Shell bids on uh, block uh, 31 and a, uh, a uh, joint venture of, um, oh, I can uh, use some uh, real or fictitious names here. Uh, we could say uh, Texaco uh, forms a partnership with uh, Chevron, which, uh, and it also includes uh, 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 Elf, a French company, and so they could uh, work together, uh, each of them contributing uh, information and interpretation, and then uh, somehow splitting up uh, what percentage each one has. So uh, we might have uh, ELF have 51% uh, of the uh, interest, and uh, Chevron have 24%, uh, and uh, Texaco have, I think, 25% would get me it to 100 I have another question that's come in. Uh, I believe this is from Otark Kwan, uh, who asks, if there's a limited regional geologic data like outcrop, how or where uh, are you able to infer the lithology of formations? The, um, the Determination of lithologies when we don't have local well control is uh, a part of um, uh, what we call seismic stratigraphy and in particular seismic facies analysis. And uh, if I go down here, uh, seismic facies analysis, if I stay on schedule, we'll talk about on uh, September 14th. Um, another thing that is done with seismic stratigraphy is to make uh, 
pre-drilled geological age predictions. And uh, that is a topic that uh, I have not included uh, in these series of lectures. Uh, it is um, uh, something that was done uh, relatively successfully uh, ever since I started my career back in uh, 1977. Uh, these days, we have fewer and fewer areas where we don't have at least some uh, well data or outcrops from um, the fringes of the basin so that we uh, don't have a good handle on what the geological ages are uh, and have to just rely on the seismic. If you're interested in uh, pre-drill age predictions using seismic stratigraphy, I would refer you to AAPG Memoir 26, uh, which is the foundational book for seismic stratigraphy. All right, uh, currently out of questions. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just waiting if any others come in. But uh, if not, uh, we can archive this, put it up on the web, and then uh, there's the Fred schedule for next uh, week and beyond. Great. Uh, Andy, I appreciate you uh, hosting our session today, and I appreciate the uh, people who have been watching, and especially the people who have been uh, uh, trying to um, stump me with some of their questions. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Uh, no, my pleasure. Um, so I will uh, stop recording here, put this on the web, and uh, there will be webinars next week for uh, additional viewing. Great. And I hope everyone has a good afternoon. All right. Thanks, Fred. Take care. Signing off.